Hey folks, Quilly Keen here, and welcome to Let's Play Victoria 2, House Divided. This is going to be the intro to our eventual Let's Play. We're doing this on a live stream, so we're going to have a little bit of discussion with the uh, live streaming audience about what we're going to do. Now, there had been a lot of discussion, I posted this some time ago on my website, about who to play. Um, there were a lot of opinions back and forth, and a lot of people, well, a lot of people said a lot of things, but quite a few people believe that Japan might be a good pick, which is good because that's where I was leaning towards myself. Um, Japan's going to be kind of interesting and a little bit non-standard because Japan is, does not start the game as one of the civilized nations. Um, at the time this game starts, Japan is has been isolated for a very long time, historically speaking. Um, hasn't had access to a lot of trade or technology or outside culture or influence and has been pretty has been pretty backwards up until this point effectively or not so much backwards as it's been standing still right um, while the rest of the so-called Western world has proceeded forward and so it's um, it's it's in a bit of a rough spot, and it counts as a primitive nation at the start of this. And one thing to know about Victoria 2 is there are various classes of nations in here. I mean, there's basically uncivilized and civilized, and then once you're a civilized nation, then it goes, you've, you've got the sort of standard civilized nation, and then a secondary power, and then a great power. And these things make a big difference for a lot of things. Um, one of the big parts of Victoria 2 is trade. Uh, which is one of the reasons I love it a lot, because I'm quite interested in the effects of trade over time. I mean, every great nation in the history of Earth has been a great nation because of its ability to trade, effectively, is, is a lot of how a lot of these things have worked, um, especially historically speaking. Trade was just such a big thing, and it still is. Um, as Japan, especially being uncivilized, most of our industrial capacity and therefore our ability to generate money uh, will come at the artisan level. Um, and these are just people sort of crafting things at home, producing things at home, not in a factory setting. And where they get a lot of their goods is going to be buying the goods on an international market, the raw goods, transferring them or transforming them into some sort of finished good, and then trying to resell it. The problem is that when you're low down on the totem pole in terms of primitive, civilized, secondary, and um, great power nations, you don't have access. The great powers get first crack at buying raw goods, and of course they tend to have a big industrial base in the first place, so they tend to buy up a lot of it. And then the second dairy powers get a chance, and so on and so forth. And once you get to the bottom of the heap in the pr primitive nations, there's not a lot of opportunity to, left to buy things. So you're left having to make do with the goods that you, um, that you kind of have just left over, um, which, which is not great and tends to leave you kind of poor. Uh, and so going up in those ranks is very important. Now within the, the sort of level that you are, you, get, you compete with other nations at the same, in the same group based on your prestige. And prestige is an incredibly important thing in Victoria too. You want to have as much as possible. Because even as great powers go, going from something like the seventh great power to the, or the, yeah, the seventh great power to the second great power dramatically transforms your ability to to purchase goods and to have, you know, to just feed the economic engine of your people. Um, so the uncivilized nations start in a really bad place. And if we were to start in 1839, which is the, the earliest you can start in Victoria, you would also start in a terribly, terribly, terribly bad place. You see, I've got a few saves here. I've done a couple of test runs. Um, and this was, well, it doesn't have the date that I actually played this, but this was actually months ago. But I discovered that starting in 1839 is not something you want to do as Japan, because the problem is you start completely isolated like this primitive nation. Now, historically, what happened to Japan is sometime in the 1860s, I think late 1860s, some dude from America showed up with a big-ass ship and said, listen, we want access to your trade and your resources, and you're going to open your borders or else. And there was this big ass ship. There were big ass ships and things like that. They just couldn't do anything about it. It was it was impressive and scary and it, it caused uh, Japan to recognize that it was kind of in a bad place. And there was this incredible transformation that happened in Japan. There was this the restoration of the emperor because up until that point, there'd been an emperor sort of 
in name, but he wasn't really influential. It was the, the Daimos, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, that controlled Japan, and, you know, so there was this emperor, but he didn't really have much power or anything like that. Um, and so there was this, eventually this movement, the Meiji Restoration, which put the emperor back sort of at the top of Japan, and also brought in all this, this uh, technological revolution as they imported these sorts of ideas from, uh, from the rest of the world, basically. Um, and you're talking about something that, I mean... Think about what happened to Japan. This was in the late 1860s. I think they sort of had to open their borders. Um, and the restoration and all this sort of thing happened. And then less than 100 years later, you have them being an incredibly powerful nation that's, that's challenging the United States in World War II. Um, like definitely less than 100 years later. And then, you know, now they are, you know, one of the leading nations in the entire world in, in terms of culture and technology um, and all kinds of things. So Japan just like went through, it, it's incredible what happened over there. But it all happened with this sort of, this sort of transformation. Now, the problem with starting 1836 is you start off in this primitive nation and things suck. The, this sort of visit of the United States the way, the best way to explain it in the context of this game, great powers can bring other nations into their circle of influence, their sphere of influence, and when that happens, there's a sort of secondary market um, that happens. You're no longer buying goods off the world market. The first thing that gets to happen is you get to buy goods within your sphere of influence. And when Japan gets brought into the sphere of influence of any great power, then it has access to goods, real goods for the first time. And it's able to, it, its trade just goes up dramatically. And so the problem with starting in 1836 is sometimes you get lucky and one of the nations fear you. And sometimes the nations either ignore you or fight over you and keep screwing each other over and none of them ever get to bring you into their sphere of influence. And it's completely hit and miss and completely random, no good at all. So I'm going to start be starting at the 1861 starting point because in 1861 Japan starts off in America's sphere. Um, which is really, really, really good for us. Um, yeah, it's, and we're, we've, we've advanced um, technologically a little bit. We are a partially westernized nation. That doesn't really matter. I can actually westernize faster if I start in 1836 than if I start in 1861, but it still ends up being bad because I have no economy whatsoever. So westernizing just means getting a certain set of basic technologies, at which point you're considered to be a civilized nation, then you get to do normal technology and much more trade, and you just become just considerably more potent. So that's why we're going to start in 1861. As much as I like starting further back, Japan just can't do it. It's just impossible. So now we're going to start sphered, which means we're going to start off with proper trade. It also means we're going to get to do the Meiji Restoration, um, because that's, that's when you flip over your, your government form, basically. And it has all sorts of other impacts in Japan. Mostly it gives us a huge tech boost. Um, and you can do something called the Early Meiji Restoration in this game. Um, and then you get that tech boost even earlier. You could get it in 1836, which is the earliest start, which sounds really good. Uh, the problem is it really pisses off a lot of people, and you almost certainly get a revolution in your hand. You get a civil war that happens. And um, in my test runs, I was able to knock down that civil war pretty effectively. But in the meantime, you end up slaughtering so much of your population that, again, you just end up kind of being screwed, and the whole thing ends up meaning that you never really get the ball rolling. So... That is going to be, that is going to be that. We're gonna we're gonna start as Japan. We're gonna start in 1861. We are going to start off as uh, the U Americas, one of our. I don't know what you call it. Sphered nations, I suppose. Uh, the Civil War is going on. Start of 1861. USA versus CSA which is not really going to involve us in any way whatsoever. Um, it does slow down the U.S. a little bit. I mean, the Civil War is inevitable, so it doesn't really matter terribly much. Um, I think that's probably... Oh, uh, and what are our plans? Well, the way I'm going to play Japan is this. We have we discovered how the world has sort of changed without us. That there are all these imperial powers all over that are spreading their influence all over the place. And we've decided that's what we want to be. We want to be an imperial power. Within a couple of dozen years, we are going to be in that position. We are rapidly going to rise to great power status and try to spread our influence all over. We want to go beyond the borders of our island because we've realized that this is, you know, this is far too limiting. Our first target is going to be Korea. 
Now, what's interesting is if you ever check out some of the after action reports of a lot of Victoria 2 people who have played Japan before, they're mostly playing without the House Divided expansion pack. Uh, the House Divided expansion pack does lots of things. It adds a lot more of the Civil War sorts of things. I mean, that famously a House Divided, I believe, is referencing the American Civil War. Um, but it also changes quite a few things about the map structure, you know, for balance or for this or for whatever. Uh, so I think without the expansion, Korea is just kind of a nation onto its own. With the expansion, however, Korea is a satellite of the Chinese Empire, which complicates things just a little bit, because obviously China is a little bit big. Um, we are going to have the advantage early on of slightly more technology, because we're going to be partially westernized. Um, the first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to release Korea from Chinese control. Luckily, that's pretty easy to do. And then at some point later, we're going to want to invade Korea properly and actually annex it to Japan. Um, and again, there we're kind of going to be rolling the dice because sometimes Korea is going to be totally isolated and we'll just be able to take them pretty easily. Sometimes at that point, they'll once again be allied by China or in Russia's sphere or something like that. And then things become considerably more difficult. We're also going to try to see what else we can sort of grab um, around just the the seas here. We may, uh, we'll probably be able to take Brunei. We might be able to take uh, Johor, Johor, Johori, something. I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Uh, it's not often possible because usually the United Kingdoms have their eyes set on that. If we can get various technologies open, we may try to claim a bunch of these little islands all over here. Um, and uh, then, well, I'm thinking South America is a pretty juicy target. Not terribly advanced, um, so we should be able to grab some things there. We're also, hopefully, we're going to make great power status, and we're going to start to sphere things. I don't want to sphere anything nearby, because anything that's in your sphere, you can't attack, because that seems kind of jerky. Um, so what we'll probably do is just sphere whatever we can that's not terribly close. Uh, I think I'd like to grab a lot of the Middle East because that sounds like fun. And that's it. That is our setup for the game. That is going to be the general strategy. So um, let's go ahead and let's hit play. We'll take a look at our actual territory in the game itself. So we are paused right now. So we've got our nation here, and if we flip over to our political map mode, you can clearly see us highlighted. And if we zoom down, we can see we've got quite a few provinces. And in terms of natural resource production, oh yeah, we've also got these islands down here, which has a little bit of steel. I think that's what that icon is. Or iron, rather. Uh, and then wheat, wheat, a little bit of coal, which is nice. Wheat, uh, this is cotton, plenty of tea production, some fish, a little more coal, a little sulfur. Like, we're not too bad off. We got a little bit of iron, a little bit of coal, kind of all over. It's not bad. But the reason we want Korea, uh, in addition to just, you know, being expanding and everything is very, very good, is in northern Korea, there is two, three more coals, four more iron, which is going to be really quite good. Oh, there's another coal down in South Korea as well. Uh, so we're really going to try to claim all this. It's going to be amazing. I'm not sure if we're ever going to war with China directly. I mean, there may be defensive wars. I don't know. Um, assuming we're able to take Korea, we'll set up some forts along the northern edge, and we may leave it at that. Uh, we'll see what we can do. There's quite a bit more coal all over on the, the east coast here, so if we can grab that, that'll be awesome. Um, one of the other things that changed in the expansion, normally Japan is able to take these little islands here pretty quickly, but what's going to happen is Russia is going to claim those pretty early on, so we're not really going to have much of a choice. Is there no music? Or am I just not hearing it? There we are. So, um, yeah, we'd actually start with a pretty sizable military. You know, oh, the, there's been a big patch that has come out since the last time I've played. So you know what? Half my expectations are probably going to change. I'm pretty sure the number of armies I'm starting with is different. There's actually way too many armies just in this one slot. It's fading off due to attrition or exceeding our supply limit. And we've started with more ships. Yeah, things have definitely changed. So that's it. So um, the, one of the first things we're going to do is we're going to, uh, we're going to go to China. 
and we're going to ju justify a future war, and we're going to do a, uh, a release puppet on them to get them to release Korea. But that is going to be for next time, for the real game. This is it for the introduction. At some point, we're going to go and play the real game, and that'll be sometime in the future, once Civ 5 is done. See you next time, folks. Bye-bye.